<laughs> well, I know it's a couple minutes early, but I think we'll go ahead and get started because like last week, I'm not entirely certain I can get through this whole part of the chapter um, in the time that we have. So if we start early, maybe we'll come a little closer to doing that. So we're doing the second half of chapter 10 from the Dempsey book. Why is this not? How many ants did it and uh, Dennis did the first half last week, and I wasn't here, but I did listen by Zoom. So I'm, I'm going to do just kind of a quick little review of what he went over in case anybody's here that wasn't here last week. That hopefully we'll all be starting sort of from the same place. So um, in this chapter, the author, Albert Dempsey, is uh, using truth and whether something is loving and ethical as his criteria to evaluate whether we can trust in the Bible, and in particular, we're talking about the Old Testament and the prophets and so forth. Um, and he said last week, Dennis, I think, pointed out that, you know, when he was taught in seminary about how to look at scripture for truthfulness, um, he had five different, five or six different criteria that he was taught. He said consistently, these were the only two that really mattered in every case. And so he felt it was easier for the reader to to deal with two rather than five or six. And basically, he's trying to answer the question, which passages of the Bible uh, should we cherish? That was the word that he used. And he also used the word trustworthiness, which I thought was an interesting choice because trustworthiness is a word uh, that is formally, former, formally, not formally, not before, but in, in a formal sense, used in qualitative research uh, to define the reliability of the information that the researcher is collecting. Qualitative research is the type of research where a person goes out into the field and wants to learn more about a community or a culture, their belief systems, um, you know, go to the Amazon basis, base and what do the Indians down there believe, what's important to them. And so that type of a researcher asks those questions and then reports back and and says, this is what I think is going on here. And so the reliability of that information is specifically identified as trust, trustworthiness. So it's appropriate for our discussion because we're talking about you know, the stories that were told, preserved and told by people 2000 years ago. And we wanna ask the question, is it trustworthy? And then he said some passages that aren't trustworthy on, on the opposite side are what he called spurious. I don't know how many of you have heard or used that word before. Again, it's a scientific word. I saw this a lot when I was taking my statistics courses. And spurious means not genuine or authentic, something that's false, something that's counterfeit, something that's not in, as claimed. And in, in the science of statistics, the word spurious means I have bad data or I have badly interpreted my data. I've, I've read what's in front of me. I've come to some conclusions and the conclusions aren't accurate. They are spurious. So they're, you know, they're going to lead us astray if we, you know, if we follow that path. So basically there's two possibilities. There's two, uh, there's a fork in the road and we can either journey down the fork that takes us to information that we can trust, or we can take the fork that takes us down the road to information that we can't trust. And that's what Dempsey is trying to, to help us learn in, in this chapter. Um, some of the relevant terms that I heard on Zoom last week discussed in the class um, discussion when you guys were talking about what's truth and you know how do I how do we identify what's truth? I heard someone talk about different truths versus uh, one truth, one one you know there can only be one truth and everything else is false, or maybe there are shades of truth. I heard Jane use the word metaphorical, uh, so that's taking a story and m maybe not accepting the story as literal truth, not historically true, but it gives us information that is uh, eternal truth in some way, you know, something that is, is truthful for us. Uh, different perspectives, I heard that term. I heard my truth, you know, something that's true for me may not be true for Steve, um, but that's because I perceive it in that way. That's my perspective. Uh, Ryan's not here today, but he used the term malleable, which I thought was very good. Malleable means bendable. Okay, so sometimes truth is a little bit, uh, for some people, a little bit flexible. And then whole picture was another term that I heard. So that's kind of some of the discussion that, that went on. Uh, another question, what if only one criterion is satisfied? What if a, a scripture is 
verifiably true in, in terms of the history, uh, but we don't like the fact that it's not loving and ethical. It's, you know, it's it's mean spirited or uh, you know presents a negative perspective of God. You know, what do we do with that? Well, it's it's still true. It's just not loving and ethical, so we wouldn't embrace it as something that allows us to cherish that scripture or, or to find it trustworthy. Um, somebody else asked, what if there, you know, what if the records were changed? Well, uh, don't doubt that the records have changed. I mean, older, as we've gotten older and older copies of the Bible, there are things that have been added over the centuries or reworded. And then certainly translation is an issue here because how, um, how an expert translates from the Greek or the Hebrew into English is, is going to have a difference on our perception of, of what that passage of scripture means. So. We also have different versions of the Bible. Yeah, and for, we, for, for exactly that reason. Usually it's a, a translation issue, right? Uh, the, comedians, the comedians have had a lot of fun with this. If you watch late night TV, which I don't do very often, but um, I used to watch Stephen Colbert's show where he, uh, he played, he, he kind of played the persona of a very conservative talk show host. Um, I figured out after a while it was comedy and it was yeah. Literal a lot truth. of people didn't. <laughs> a lot of people didn't. Um, but he he invented a word in 2005. Maybe you've heard him use this called truthiness. <laughs> it's actually in the American the English lexicon now. Oh, that's uh, so truthiness is the belief yep. in what you in what you feel to be true rather than what the facts will support. And I think that's a problem. You know <laughs> that we sometimes have is you know we believe things that maybe aren't well supported by the facts. And then uh, another another one that I do watch is Bill Maher on Friday nights, and he has this little bit that he does. I don't know it for a fact; I just know it's true. <laughs> so kind of kind of the same. I literally used that the other day. Same thing. <laughs> but I, I think you know they're and they're poking fun at, at at how the public sometimes sees the truth. So um, a short two slides. We're going to talk about uh, what truth is. From a philosophical perspective, this is not in your book. I just thought it would be interesting to, to present this. And so the nature of truth is something that has been extensively explored. If you had an entire lifetime, you could not read probably everything that had been written about truth. Um, but it goes way back to the ancient uh, Greek philosophers and, and has been talked about for 2,800 years or more. Written about. So there's three predominant theories of uh, truth and you can look at these and kind of see which one maybe seems the most right for you or or fits for your your perspective on truth the first is the correspondence theory of truth and that says something is true if and only if it corresponds with the facts of how things are so to me this sounds like what a lawyer might be trying to find out we're trying to find out what the facts are and then you know the truth is somewhere uh, in those facts but it has to correspond with with the evidence and then there's the coherence theory of truth. Truth in its essential nature is a systematic coherence, which is the character of a significant whole. So truth has to be holistic. You know, it has to, um, all of the things which are true have to be somehow, you know, are somehow connected because they're true. And then uh, this one is probably the more recent. This is the pragmatist or practical theory of truth. Uh, and that says that beliefs about what is true do not conflict with our experience. And so there means that there has to be harmony between what we experience in life and what is, is reality. It's just a very practical way of looking at truth. So are, are there any of these? I know we've just introduced them. Maybe you've never heard of any of them before. I hadn't until I looked them up. Um, are, are any of these describing your philosophies about truth? Or, or just does one seem more logical than the others? For me, it's the correspondence theory. Okay. Fact-driven. See, that's mine the mine kind of person I am, too. I, I'm fact-driven. I guess mine would be more pregnant. Okay. I mean, when I went to court, the judge didn't like me saying, to the best of my knowledge, I was telling the truth. <laughs> you said that as a potential juror? No, as oh. a, during my divorce, when I was oh. giving my, it was like, well, how can I say that, that it is truly the truth? It's the truth to that the best I, of my memory is uh, better. 
and to the best of my knowledge for a divorce case kind of case. <laughs> otherwise, yeah. you're, otherwise, you're sounding wishy-washy to the judge. Oh, well, that's like, well, oh, okay. Because I was going... <laughs> Oh, the truth is, I experienced it. That's I why know. lawyers say, to the best of my knowledge, it was my understanding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody yeah, else? Correspondence, uh -huh. coherence, or pragmatist? Or none of the above? Do none of these really coincide with? I think, the, I think I'm like you. I'm, I'm more of a pragmatist, practical person. Thank you. <clears throat> I think the pragmatic theory kind of allows our beliefs or understandings about truth to exist in lockstep with our experiences, our personal experience. You know, we talked about, you know, things that are really true versus what we perceive. Yeah. And I think that does kind of allow for that. I kind of like the correspondence theory, but from my personal experience, it's all kind of Yeah. Okay. And a lot of this, I think, I think individually we're we're probably kind of wired to feel that one of these is more right than the other. So a lot of it has to do just with the kind of the way we think and the kind of person that we are. I I will blame God for that. He created it. So. <laughs> I think I'm a <clears throat> combination of the different ones. Yeah. You know, okay. Sometimes sometimes the correspondence fits best, sometimes the pragmatist. Yeah. Can you explain the middle one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so reading that one too. Yeah, as I understand it, um, coherence means that truth has to agree with other things that are true. You know, that that you can't say one, well, let's say that we have a truth about that we think about the Bible. And later on, that same topic comes up later on, and it doesn't sound like it's as true as it did the first time we read it. Uh, but it's two different locations in the Bible, two different, you know, what we're going to talk about today, I'll, I'll kind of give you a spoiler here. Um, we talk about, and we're going to talk about a scripture uh, where um, the, the ancient Hebrews believed that God rewarded good behavior and God punished bad behavior. And then we have the book of Job who comes along later and says the opposite. It's true. Sometimes good, bad things happen to good people. So there's a conflict in the in the truthiness of those two. <laughs> and I think that, you know, for them both to be true, they have to be coherent and they're not. Uh, that, that's, like, that's my interpretation. Like of that. If you have one database that says that's the that's the guy, stuff lines you have another one that says maybe that's the guy. You just kind of go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, no, you okay, don't. That's the guy. Can genealogy be that all? No, I, well, yeah, it can be way off. Fact, well, know, factually, be, no, people put in it. It's put DNA. their information in for Right. You can go to DNA and correct all that. Well, I was going to say, which one was it? One of them, when I was looking, my father isn't, isn't mentioned. His older brother is mentioned as a child of my grandparents, but not my father. Oops. So he so didn't they, exist. <laughs> yeah. It's not coherent. Well, good genealogy, you put down not only the the grandparents or parents, but you also try to put several siblings to keep it accurate. Uh, you, but there are some people it. who don't, right, you, you source, you source it, it with good sources. Might have been genealogy.com, but somewhere you source it with good they, they didn't get uh, my father birth. input. Birth records, death records. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call change this. DNA. Okay. <laughs> You're off on a tangent. You're off on a tangent. Okay, we'll talk about genealogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get back to truth. Um, so I am thinking about truth this week. I thought, how can I present this um, maybe a little bit graphically just to show the two types of truth that we said that we embrace? On the one hand are the facts, the observable evidence, the reality, the verifiable history. And on the other side, we have our perceptions, opinions, and attitudes, our personal experiences, and that has to do with uh, cultural influences and how we were brought up. How, who knows, and, and maybe you all know this already, uh, what is the most important determinant of what religion you're going to be as an adult? What determines like whether you're going to be a Christian or parents? Okay. The parenting and where you were born. Okay. So yeah. if you're born in India, you're likely going to, you know, chances are, you're going to be a Hindu or maybe a, a Buddhist. 
If you're born in Asia, probably a Buddhist or Shinto. If you're born in uh, you know this country these days, probably a Christian, maybe Jewish. Um, so you know, so that has a lot to do. And people don't tend to leave their religions a whole lot. You don't see a lot of Muslims converting to Christianity or the other way around. Tend to sort of stay, and we we might you know go after different flavors of Christianity. And maybe we get tired of. Um, or, you know, Latter day Saintism, and we like, go to the Methodist Church or something. A lot of people do that. Way. But we tend to stay in the same broad category as individuals would want. Right. Tradition, and then, yes. tradition, yeah. All of those things get rolled into that. Uh, and then metaphorical truth that, that we talked about that Jane brought up last time, which I think. I did get corrected, though. How's that? Because it, metaphorical truth really isn't truth, it's more just lesson. Okay. Yeah. But it, but if it if it teaches a value I liked your response to me. I mean, if it teaches a value that we all commonly hold to be true, I mean that's that's a level of truth in my mind. And, you know, we're it's not the murdering concepts that are true. Yeah. Right. The, the, the story. Yeah. No, then that's what I said. The it's story the story is a story. It's a fable yeah. or a myth or whatever, but it yeah. it teaches us a value or we use that to teach our children a value that we think is important that we hope that they'll take with them through their life. Yeah. Finger thing. So, you know, truths on the on the left. Um, I, I question mark this. Should we call it, you know, is this absolute truth? You know, things that we can actually demonstrate to be true. And the truths on the right to me seem somewhat conditional or circumstantial. They're they're not the same level of of, of truth, but you know, some people are going to hold them to be true. This is what people hold to be true. I'm not saying everything is always going to be true if it's in one of those boxes. But are men on the left and women on the right? <laughs> <laughs> you have to leave. <laughs> I think it's true that I think it's true that you're about to get walked upside the head there, Steve. <laughs> Hello, three of us on this side, Steve. Okay. <laughs> This is, and you've seen these little cartoons. This is, you know, the difference between uh, perception. You know, they they both see a different number depending on the yeah. perspective, and they, and for each one, it is truth. Right? Well, anybody who's ever been, been in a jury trial, trial. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Here, this optical illusion. You know, how many um, boards are there? Uh, the guy on the right sees three, and I see three on the right. But if you look on the left, it's four boards. They're both true, right? I don't see four. Oh, wait, yeah. Look, look, at, the end. End. <laughs> look at the yeah, end. Yeah, look at the end of the beams there. The look at the plank. Oh, it's more flexible. Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back to back to our book. That right there this was, uh, the uh, this was the information that from Dennis, one of Dennis's slides that you can talk about five strands of belief. And so Dempsey wants us to know where these passages of scripture came from in terms of the evolutionary development of Hebrew thinking about God, um, and then I've noticed today in, in the ones that I'm going to be talking about, there were two additional strands that he talks about, the salvation strand and the apocalyptic, so I'm going to add those two uh, to, to that list. Um, these are the topics. I, there's one that I left out because it was repetitive of another one of the scriptures, and I didn't think we needed to go over it twice, uh, but these are the ones we're going to try to get to in the next 44 minutes. Uh, God is a loving parent. God does not need messengers. God has awesome majesty. God demands obedience to statutes. God is partial to the chosen people. The Lord is my shepherd and a mystical detour. And hopefully we'll get through all of those, but if it looks like we're getting close to the end, I'll come back to this slide and let you choose which ones you want to talk about. All right, first one, God is a loving parent. This is from Hosea chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and I fed them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so a little bit about Hosea. Um, this comes from the prophetic strand. He was a prophet uh, who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. Most of the prophets were from the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, but Hosea was one of the early prophets before the Assyrians uh, took the Hebrews away from uh, the northern kingdom. And he um, 
his influence is evident for about a 28 year period from 750 to 722 BCE. Uh, Hosea called for justice and religious reform, but in his book, in his uh, writings, he also stressed the need for love, which was kind of a new introduction in terms of prophetic thought. Most of the time, the prophets talked about relationships between people and God. And justice was, was a very common topic, but there wasn't as much said about love. And so in Hosea, we have the earliest description in the Old Testament of God as a loving parent. And in addition to this, if you're familiar with the book of Hosea, he's also the one that uh, wrote metaphorically about Israel being the unfaithful wife. And so God is the diligent husband. Israel is the unfaithful wife who goes out and has affairs, you know, with, with these other gods. Uh, and yet God calls her back and, you know, wants to have a continuing relationships. So there's actually two love stories here, one with the, the parents and the children and one with the unfaithful wife. And that, I like that picture because it could be interpreted either way. It could be a young, a young wife there or a child that the father is bringing back home. Okay. All right. Um, so now we get to talk about the validity of this passage and um, the truthfulness of this passage hinges, I think, on the first statement here that's highlighted in yellow. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I'm going to ask you uh, here to put away your knowledge about the book of Matthew, where Matthew uh, uses it to identify Jesus as the one who was called out of Egypt as an infant, you know, uh, when they Herod was murdering the babies and they had to flee to Egypt, okay, because that has been used, I think, incorrectly in the New Testament. The original interpretation was something else. So what is what is Hosea talking about here? Who, who is the son? Who is the child, metaphorically, in, in that scripture? All the people. Hmm? All the people. Yeah, the people. Okay. And so God is bringing Israel, people so, right. out of Egypt. Egypt. So, what story should this, should the reader think about? When Moses. He sees this? Well, yeah, Moses. Okay, the Exodus. Yeah, this is, that's exactly what um, Hosea yeah, what is done. alluding to. So, my question is uh, in order for it to be true, and now I'm asking you about historical truths and factual truths, um, is, is the Exodus story? From what what you know, or what you have learned, historically true. <laughs> Is it? Do we have actual archaeological proof? There's some natural truth about it. No, it's it, not it, my question. <laughs> it didn't question. happen in the right time frame. Okay. So I don't. Can we say I don't know? <laughs> you can say I don't know. Yeah. Right. I'm not I ignoring don't you guys back there, but I right, speak yeah, up. Can we can make the Bible say anything we no. want. That's true. That's true. I, oh, that's I think that if you have previously <clears throat> archaeological research, <laughs> well, that's not a master. I know where that's coming from. Oh, I've hey, hey, got the microphone. Right. All right. We'll, we'll pause for a few seconds. <laughs> Okay, yes, you're correct. Well, I, you have, I have alluded to. What did you say? You were with me. Paul has back evidence supporting a mass. So. The, the numbers are always way huge. <laughs> now there's. But they haven't found everything yet. Making discoveries daily, yeah. <laughs> and they're when they make discoveries, they're showing they're not, they're not true. So I will say that Dempsey uh, seems to agree that this is a factual happening. Okay, he he doesn't say anything to the contrary in the way he writes about it. I get the feeling that he he believes this is a true a true story. I think back then we did think it was true. It's consistent with the other stories in the Bible. If if that's his criteria, yeah coherence theory. However, and this is what Jonathan was saying that I've talked about before. Uh -huh. uh, beginning in about 2004 or 2005, um, there are 
publications in the academic and archaeological literature that have begun to call, call this story into question as historical fact. And the new terminology is that this is a national foundation myth. This is a story that was created by the Hebrews to explain what, where they thought their origins were, okay, where they thought that they came from. And the story has was kind of perpetuated based on the need for self-identification as a monotheistic group of people um, who felt very different from everybody else who lived in Palestine in those days. Okay. Again, to, uh, to Arlene's point, you know, maybe not everything's been discovered. I, I would agree that that's probably true. It is true there is an absolute absence of archaeological evidence. And the Israeli government, and, and most of the people that have written about this and attest to the accuracy of those findings are Israeli archaeologists. The government of Israel, I understand, spent many millions of dollars trying to prove that Moses and the Exodus were real because how better to uh, support their claim uh, to the ownership of Israel than to have you know evidence that, that Moses, led by God, brought you know this group of people into Israel. Uh, but there is not. <clears throat> if you look at the dates, uh, Jacob was taken into Israel or taken into Egypt, according to the story, hostage, probably sometime around 1800 BC. Roughly, I don't have the exact date there. Uh, he was given an Egyptian wife after he began working for the Pharaoh. And uh, from those two individuals over the period of 430 years, according to the Bible, according to biblical accounts, 2.4 million Israelites were held in captivity in, in Egypt. Now, I need Ron. Sometimes this is your homework assignment, Ron. Assuming... Assuming a generation is 30 years, 430 20. years, what about 18 20. generations? So 20. 20 years, okay. So maybe a little more, maybe 24 generations. You start with two people and say that they had five children, and then their children had you know, five children. If you extrapolate. Help, figure out, not right now, but sometimes figure out for me. <laughs> figure out for me how long would it take to get the two point four million people? Or how many kids would each family have to have? Yeah. <laughs> you put that in the equation, <laughs> and you're going to have a lot of them that died along the way. Yeah, and I'm and I'm I'm, I'm stacking the deck against myself because I think it's going to be less than that. I don't know, but well, farmers in America had like twelve. And, and probably, you know, probably early on there was there had to be mixing between the Israelites and the Egyptians, so yeah. others may have been brought in. You know, it's understandable. But we don't have any archaeological evidence. I'm not going to. Okay, question about that. Yeah, maybe you don't have archaeological evidence for 2.4 million people migrating. What if there was only say 2,400? So you know that was brought up. In, evidence would be a lot. Smaller. Yeah, one of the books that I've read about this. Um, you, you have, let's say you have 2,400 people that left Egypt, uh, walked around the Sinai Desert and lived for 40 years and then, you know, came to Palestine. Um, they, they talk about the Vikings coming to this country in the, whatever, 13th century or whenever it was. A small handful, probably one boatload of Viking raiders uh, came to this country stayed for about 10 years and then left but for some reason uh, either it was inhospitable to them or they wanted to go back to their home or whatever it was so we have 20 vikings we're here for 10 years there's all kinds of evidence and so the archaeologists would say it's impossible that that even 2400 people left no mark you know they can't they were a nomadic people well but they, had like to have, but they had to have bowls and yeah. I'm not I'm just kind of I'm I, 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 you know I, I may not have the specific answers to that. I'm just saying when, when people have way. been somewhere for a while, they, they, they leave trash heaps, they leave evidence, you know, that, that they were there. Uh the second part of this is outside of the Bible account, we don't have any historical evidence, and people would say, Well. Egypt was a fairly advanced society. They would have kept some records. That's probably true. You know, opposite argument uh, for Arlene would be, well, the records were lost or, you know, burned or right. whatever. Also possibly true. Okay. I can't. I can't. Yeah. Well, the, what the Library of Alexander. Now. Now, I read, I don't know if it's true or not, but there was one high official 
in the Egypt uh, government who has erased all of the uh, history and uh, they think that was Moses. Okay, that I, you know, that's interesting. How do they know if he was erased from history? How do they know? Well, there, they there was a pharaoh who was erased from history. Yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, about him. Yeah. because yeah, we later on found his tomb. Yeah. Right. So like, they weren't quite complete. And that was because they, they didn't like him. But he was right? dead. From what I understand, they took their, the their likeness off of the yeah. Yeah. stone yeah. statues yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, in, you know, uh, because I don't want to leave out the possibility of doubt, I, I would say maybe so, maybe that happened. I'm just saying, you know, you know in science, uh, there there is either the existence of something or the non-existence of something, and and the the philosophy of science is to demonstrate the existence of something. A scientist will not try to prove the non-existence of something. So if we haven't yet proved it or shown it to be existing, there's nothing we can do about that. We just have to. You know, you keep looking, keep searching, and, yeah. and maybe it's something. Yeah, it does matter. Uh, no, but dark it's not... matter. It's a dark, dark matter. matter. We know oh, there's dark, dark matter, matter yeah, but yeah. we can't. So you haven't ever... Can't find it. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. But, but they keep searching, you know, they, the academics will keep searching for the existence of things. They're not going to try to disprove something that doesn't exist. That's what I'm saying. And then this is probably the most compelling. Um, the last 20 years, uh, genetic testing is now widely available. And the archaeologists who have exhumed uh, the remains of people from uh, known Hebrew uh, sites, living sites, um, that that has that those tissues have been tested, and this is not something that is very limited to just a handful. I, I don't remember the exact number, but it was between 700 and 900 individuals that they had exhumed and, and tested. So in Phantom Court. Hmm? In Phantom Court. Okay, so. First of all, I want to ask you, what do you think? So let's remember what we know about Jacob. Jacob or Joseph. Joseph came from Jacob. Jacob came from Isaac. Isaac came from Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Joseph was the grandson or great grandson of Abraham, according to the biblical account. Mm -hmm. Where was Abraham from? Um, what two letter name? Down. No. Where, where was Ur? In Adam. No. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Saudi Arabia. Where, where from? Saudi Arabia. Oh. That's the same. Go back to the beginning of time. Huh? What country today is formerly Mesopotamia? Was it Iran? Iraq? Close. Iraq? Iraq. 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 Mostly Iraq. Iraq. Syria. Uh, a little bit of Turkey. Okay. You know so. that area of the world in there. So Abraham and his family, Abraham and Sarah or Sariah, whatever. You know, came to the Middle East, came to Palestine, um, had a child, that was Isaac. And then we have a couple of generations. Joseph was sold into slavery. The Bible tells us that Joseph married an Egyptian wife who was given to him by Pharaoh. So we have uh, two genetic lines that, if I'm thinking about this logically, I would want to know that the descendants of the Israelites were either Iraqi or a combination of Iraqi and Egyptian. Okay. 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 Seven to nine hundred times they have tested this, and there are disagreements. I'm not going to say this is absolute truth, but it's fairly well agreed upon. Who do you suppose that these ancient Hebrews are most genetically, most closely related to in terms of their genetics? Palestinians. <laughs> Which makes it even more sad that that's what's going on in Gaza right now. Uh, the people that are killing each other are genetically brothers and sisters. So so we're the, 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 the Israel, the people who claim to identify as Hebrews or Israelites or Israelis, are the same as the, as the Palestinians. They all they all come from that Canaanite genetic pool. They lived on the coast of Israel and then moved up into the highlands. Back to Canaan and Abel. Years ago. What's that? Cain and Abel, brothers by yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they are on the trailer. Israelis. Descendant from them too. It's well, so so there have obviously the Jews. There was the diaspora. Yeah. Okay, so the first place that the Jews went was was uh, Germany. You should know this answer. Where did where did they go? What? Where where did the Jews go? Where did, after they were uh, dispersed from uh, Israel in eighth, eighth century BCE? What you talk about this all the time. We're we're an honor to have you here today, by the way, because of this. Okay. <laughs> Armenia. 
I'm going to say okay. so. A lot of the yeah. early, a lot of the early Hebrews have Armenian blood because they commingled with the Armenians in the country. Yeah, but then they, you know, then they moved into Europe, and so now there's yeah. um, European right. genetics. Um, that's the group of Jewish people that we call the Ashkenazi Jews, if you've heard that term before. And then there are the Sephardic Jews. Anybody know where the Sephardic Jews are? Spain. From? Spain. So in the Inquisition, uh, you know, they were run out of Spain and a lot of them migrated back to Israel. A lot of the Jews in Israel are Sephardic Jews. And then there's another, another branch, what are they called? It's the Jews who were forced to become Christians in Spain during the Inquisition. They, they represent a separate group. I forgot what that's called. Anyway, so to answer your question, Robin, um, genetically, it, it's not working out either. Again, I'm not going to say that this is absolute, that there wasn't a small group of Hebrews, you know, that were led out of Egypt. Um, but I'm just saying we can't prove it at this point. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to answer the truth question for you here. Well, aren't there, didn't they do some genetic testing in Ethiopia? Yeah, there's Jews done in Africa. Well, that only proves that they didn't stay there. Yeah. Right. I, I, yeah. Oh, I'm. I'm yeah. not. I mean, that's all an aside that we went down another rabbit hole here. But uh, <laughs> we did. What, what, I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is that uh, that they should like be the Palestinians. I mean, that they are Palestinians, and so that doesn't doesn't jive with the story, uh, which may or may not have anything to do with it. So, for those who you know, that 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 doesn't matter. Uh, we can still ask the question: Is it metaphorically true? Mm. Does the story still have some truth that God loves us, God brings us out of our hardships, God rescues us, uh, delivers us from uh, captivity in, in some metaphorical uh, form? And, and I think we could probably all say yes to that. Um, is it loving and ethical? Um, absolutely. Uh, the loving nature of, of God makes it highly ethical. My only question here, you can't see the bottom there. Um, can we, I don't know if we can move the screen up a little bit. So, so my question was, well, you know, part of the story too is God destroyed Thank you, Dennis. Uh, the eldest sons and God destroyed, you know, assume, assuming the story were true, uh, there should be chariots at the bottom of the Sea of Reeds somewhere where all the Egyptian soldiers who died. That to me kind of departs a little bit from the loving ethical part of it, but okay. I, I, I see what, at least from Hosea's perspective, it's very loving. All right. Uh, this one was God does not need messengers. I almost thought maybe God does need messengers is a better title here. So I put that in parentheses and very short scripture for the Lord spoke to me thus while his hand was strong upon me. And so what we're considering here is God has the ability to work through all of us to communicate with all of us. We don't require uh, specifically a prophet to tell us what to do. You know, there's good and bad about that. We can think about that for a minute, but is it true? Oh, this is the prophetic strand, by the way. Well, according to Muslims, yes, that is true, because they don't believe that messenger. Well, Muhammad was his messenger. Yeah, I know, but they consider there's, there's that one God, God doesn't Muhammad need is help. Messenger. I, think that's, I think that's actually part of their liturgy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they see Jesus as a prophet, but they don't. They, they don't, don't see Jesus as divinity. As divinity, and I, well, they believe in Jesus. Didn't say a messenger is divine. Didn't say a messenger is necessarily divine. Yeah, no, that was a human messenger. I think is what what this is talking about here. Do we need a prophet, or can we all just be? Uh, Maybe the people that are the messengers are only the people that. Listen to God. The rest of us got the message. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Can we all be best? And, and, and I see the church. I mean, the church is going that direction. We're all called to the prophetic task, right? Yeah. So, okay. so it's not just about. It. It's not just about say. Steve Easy or Stacy Cram anymore. Yeah. It's kind of it what what is our role but, in all of but this? But it's really it's in that coherence theory truth. It's not factual truth. It's, yeah. Right. It, yeah. It's yeah. going to be the truth that we all believe in. Yeah. So, well, what he says is, um, I think he's leaning toward it's true because we've all experienced um, those moments where we've heard the still small voice or we've had a warm feeling 
that is associated in my terminology is with ecstatic experience, with a religious experience, with um, you know being in church or being at camp or something like that. I've never had a vision. I can't speak to that. I'm not sure I've ever heard a still small voice, but I can identify with the warm feeling, which to me that for me personally, that's an emotion that gets triggered by a lot of things, not just religious things, but certainly my experiences in the church have been a part of that. So does that make it true? That's what Dempsey says it's true. Because we all experience those things. The warm feeling can be misleading at times. That was my other thought. Yeah, go to a senior high camp. <laughs> Very misleading. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Remember all of our senior high camps? Oh, you know, it's totally dramatic. Have, have we had, you know, any... Yes. Uh, Especially around campfire. Experiences oh. that were blatantly false in, in our experience in this church? Yes. That started yes. out as uh, somebody proclaiming that they had this yeah, kind of an sure. experience. Without going into details, I, I can... Well, we several. just had one very recently in our congregation that was talked to me about when he thought it was... He was told to share it. It's, it's very, very personal. All right, and then Dempsey says this is consistent with how we believe God communicates. And I highlighted the word believe because I think that's a bad word choice of words to use when you're talking about is it true? Because to me, belief and truths don't always coincide. So I think he might have been a little bit off target there, in my opinion. Um, does does this satisfy your definition of truth? Is that enough, or would you like to have seen more? It does not satisfy my definition of truth. What about the people that speak in tongues, you know, during services and such? Well, is the things that they say part of truth? Don't know what they say. Well, as a, you know, when you're going through your training. As a priesthood member, uh, my, I know in the distant past when I was a young elder, and one of the things that you're called upon to do if you're presiding over a service and somebody stands and speaks prophetically or in tongues um, is, is to sometimes make a decision on behalf of the congregation about the legitimacy of that. And I've been in experiences where I felt that what was said was very consistent with our common agreement. In, in what would be the will and mind of God. Um, and, and sometimes things were said that I, I didn't feel were right. And I had one or two times in my life had to escort somebody out of the service, uh, you know, for inappropriate, it's an inappropriate thing. Those are hard calls to make, but. Um, Aren't we supposed to also have an interpretation of tongues? That goes that in the early days when they had lots of speaking in tongues, that was sort of a. I don't know whether that was an official rule or an unofficial rule, but all of the prayer meetings that I attended in Independence with my grandmother in the 1950s and 60s, there was always an interpretation. Yeah, and if I there think, wasn't, it was called into question by the presider. I think I was only at one service for somebody spoken to. And this is, you know, this is kind of a difficult area to to walk in because that's where you kind of get this, you know, is it true? Is it not true? Mm -hmm. So you have to. It, I think it should be consistent with our beliefs and, and with the worth of all persons and our love of God and love of each other. And if it's not consistent with those things, then, then we might have room to, to question. Um, so maybe this is a perceptive truth or an experiential truth. Uh, is it loving and ethical? Dempsey says the passage was neutral on this criterion. <laughs> neutral. That was easy. It can no. go either way. <laughs> All right. God's, God has awesome majesty. This is from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. The seraphs were in attendance above him, and each had six wings, which would not be dynamic. But, <laughs> with, but with two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew around. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so this is, um, you know, we, I, I, I said this myself, I, I include myself in this group. Sometimes when we pray, uh, we say something to the effect of, Lord, we come before your throne of grace. Mm -hmm. And so we have this very anthropomorphic view of God as a king sitting in a king's court. 
attended by uh, angels with six wings and other individuals. And, um, you know, that's that that image is, is kind of still with us okay, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, this is from the tribal strand uh, of a personal anthropomorphic god whose personage is limited to a throne in the temple. Uh, in, in the Moses story, in the Exodus story, they actually carried God around in the desert in the Ark of the Covenant. And when God was placed, when the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the temple, that's where God existed. So, again, a very human um, notion about the location of God today, we would probably say, well, God is, is obviously yeah, yeah. everywhere, right? Um, it, it's also from the prophetic strand, proclaiming that God is, is much grander than has ever been written about before in the Bible. And so, is it true? Talking about anthropomorphic, actually, we say God speaks is an anthropomorphic expression. Yeah. Well, God loving is too. You know, love, love and, and, um, you know, just those, those types of feelings are. Are very anthropomorphic. Uh, love is a biological feeling. How many of you knew that? Love is actually um, because of your brain chemistry. There's, there's a neuro, what neurotransmitter? Do you remember, Jeremy? What neurotransmitter is the is the love chemical? The love molecule? Right off the top of my head. Yeah, it's oxytocin. So, so we have a part of our brain that responds to uh, feelings of love and compassion for other people, and uh, when the Pituitary gland, which is the little gland in the middle of the brain that kicks out all of the important hormones, uh, kicks out some oxytocin. We, I look at Jonathan and say, Jonathan, I, I really love you as a brother. Okay. I really care about you. I'm feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> so I can tell, I can tell when my dog looks at me that there's, her brain is just full of oxytocin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the same thing as oxycontin. No, uh, uh, that's, that's different. It tells the oxytocin. So, 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 yeah, I'm just, I'm just telling you, this it? is this comment about. I really love. Well, they make pills of oxytocin. Uh, eth oh, the other thing, ethical is, you know, something. What's ethical? That's that's a human construct. But that's is it true? The, the love, question. Love, <laughs> love potion number yes. nine. Does uh, yeah. a human view of God, if that helps people worship, is that a problem? If um, God is on a phone, yeah. is that a problem? That, or does it help people visualize the creator in such a way that it's beneficial? Well, and I think you can say that a lot about a lot of parts of the Bible. If we're going to say that they're maybe not historically true, but if we accept them as having mm -hmm. metaphorical value, is that a problem? You know, is it, is it a problem to think of God in this way? I thought about God in this way for many, many years of my life. And then I, as I've moved away from sort of a more theistic uh, view of God, yeah, as an old man sitting on a throne, uh, to a more universal view of God as the, the power that exists within, the creative power that exists within the universe or whatever. Um, I'm personally I'm moving away from this, but for many people, this is still very, very, very real. Well, you know, it I, is I, a problem thinking, for... I mean, we, yeah. I, I, and I don't think it's a problem. God is, is yeah. universal and he's represented by the entire universe. And he's beyond our comprehension. And yet I still go back to, contrary to what some people they think of him as a loving father. Mm -hmm. I, I know for some women, that's an issue yeah. uh, because they didn't have fathers who were loving. But or I'm, it's created a paternalistic society yeah. that has been problematic. For well, well, everything that he's, I mean, those can be helpful, but every time you say something God is, you're limited. Yeah. Or, and I'm, I, or her. by using him, yeah. I'm right. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, So now that you men have all shared. To describe God. <laughs> you know, uh, in the ancient scriptures where people had a very anthropomorphic view of God, um, you know, they would say uh, God created us in his own image. And I think today we might look at that and say the opposite is true, that we have in many cases created God in our image. Yeah, because that helps us to understand God, you know, what God is for us personally. So does that mean that God is transgender? I have no problem getting myself into trouble. I don't need to know. <laughs> you know we can't actually 
see God, how do we know whether it's true or not? Yeah. Yeah. That's I probably think beyond people, the scope of this book. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people need to need to see God on a throne because they they need that feeling of uh, authoritarianism mm -hmm. at, at the head. Others, that's the worst thing in the world that they could imagine. It's just because of our life experiences of how we see him and how yeah. we can accept what he is and what yeah. he does for us. I guess part of what I was trying to bring out is I think we have an intellectual view of what God is. We have an emotional view mm -hmm. of what God is. Mm -hmm. And we're all schizophrenic in that way. Yeah. Uh, and, and frankly, it, when people refer to God in human terms, I don't have a problem with that. By saying God is love, God is, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, no, I don't either. I, I, I probably wouldn't. I mean, myself, I wouldn't use the word schizophrenia. I would say multidimensional. <laughs> okay. Schizophrenia. Well, you, you know, more people who hear voices words. are schizophrenic. All right. Um, so the author's like, moving on. The author says, moving on, moving on. The assumption of such a limited God falls short of our modern understanding of an infinite God. And that's kind of what I was trying to express about my own journey uh, in understanding God. Um, but he likes that the wonder of God is still consistent with our modern understanding. And I think that's answers Jonathan's question about, you know, is, is it still okay to, to think of God in this way? Well, I think the men is a women. Um, so yeah. he concludes that it's an important step in seeing God's majesty. All right, we're, we're getting short on time. I was right. afraid this was going to happen. Gonna so go. we're going to move oh. back to the topics here. Oh, Where did they go? Oh, keep going. Go down, down. Yeah, I think I'm do that. Oh, exactly that. Okay, what do you want to talk about next? Uh, we've one done the first we... three. God no, demands obedience. Exactly God is partial is to the chosen people. The Lord the is my shepherd. Or or the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, I Lord is my shepherd. Okay. <laughs> Good. That's an easy That's one. one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jade, for <laughs> getting yeah, off the hook. I didn't want to talk about some of the other ones. <laughs> all right we all know this the 23rd psalm i'm not i'm not going to um i'm not going to read it uh, but we'll think about it um the picture that i have there is looks to me like a picture of jesus and obviously that's the christian understanding of the 23rd psalm um, but because of when it was written um it was not intended to talk about jesus necessarily it was intended to talk about uh, god but uh, as christians we embrace both so is it valid? This is from the priestly strand. Um, this, and, and I will say that uh, Dempsey says, this is the priestly strand at its best. Okay. Centuries after Hosea, the notion of a loving God has now become a cherished condition. Is it true? Yeah. How is it priestly? Where is the... Uh, because it's from the Psalms, and the Psalms were largely written as liturgy for use in in, in worship. So it's from the temple, it's from the post Babylonian it's not temple area. Not giving any statutes. It's not given as law. No, but it's still priestly function, I think. And he says like at its best. Oil to be priestly. Yeah. All right. I, I think because it's involved in in early temple worship, this okay. this would have been used as as we use hymns in our worship. Okay. Yeah. So it would be considered priestly from that. It's That's definitely right. loving, yeah. which is one of the things the priest was supposed to be. It's well, it would be literally true, but no, it how, how, is it, you, how is it true to you? Um, it gives you, well, he okay. makes you, what he makes us do is sort of calming and <coughs> giving you feelings of safety, I guess, and the promise that he'll lead you through the dark time. Yeah. So I would say more movement or giving I, you I would guess if we people. went around the room, everybody has a testimony about, you know, this passage of scripture and how it has been meaningful to us. My father, when he was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, had some very powerful experiences where the 23rd Psalm was expressed to him as he was in combat. 
and and you know thinking about walking through the valley of death mm -hmm. uh, this scripture was incredibly true for him yeah Th this was mm -hmm. personal and and for the rest of his life he talked about that mm -hmm. Um, so the author says it is a valid statement, but not anything that can be necessarily supported by scientific or historical facts, but who cares? It's the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> uh, so as several have already mentioned, maybe this falls into that category of a metaphorical or a personal truth for each individual. Is it loving and biblical? Yes. Really dense as they did. Yeah, the only part that is not is preparing the table in the presence of your enemies. Yeah, yeah so the, like... <laughs> exactly. And then the and the you know the ancient Israelites kind of had that attitude that even in the more loving scriptures, there was always, you know, we're still the chosen people, we're yeah, you know, we're better than everybody else, and they get the scraps and we get the, the good stuff. So that very uh, astute there, Jonathan, you get. Uh, 20 points for that today. <laughs> 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 20 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> um, so uh, the author would say this, this scripture is the essence of love and is an affirmation of valid elements of our faith today. Okay, whichever we have probably people. time for one more. Which one do you want to do? Oh, let's do the mystical one. Yeah, yeah. that last one. Yes. Oh, okay. What? You have the answer already? West, West. Assumptions about <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, he did the math. Now we're going back to take about nine to get two million. Wow, okay, so that that would be feasible, though. Yeah, that would be some of the time. I didn't think it would be that much, but well, and that's assuming everybody has five kids and they all, you yeah. know, and about if you want your 10 kids, yeah, and except okay, okay, well, but because of the geometric nature of. So we have one, one sliver. So we have one sliver of truth. I do not understand that, that that the Exodus may have been true. That's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I heard several people say they wanted to do the mystical detour, and this is a very long scripture, so I'm just going to give you a summary here. Um, this is from the book of Daniel, and it is an account of his vision of four frightening beasts. And the beasts represented the kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, Rome, and Greece. And uh, in particular, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was a brutal king of the Seleucid Empire, which was part of the Greek dominion, but also had a separate period of time where it had a lot of influence. And you can see the Seleucid Empire went all the way over to what today is Russia and Georgia, probably the Middle East, uh, all the way up into Turkey, and then the arm on the bottom left is uh, covers all of Palestine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, there was a period of time when uh, the people of Israel were under the, the domination of the Seleucids. Um, and in the vision, uh, uh, kind of a hero figure uh, identified as the Son of Man comes in great glory and is given dominion by God. Mm -hmm. uh, early Old Testament uh, vision of, of uh, you know, what the Savior might look like or um, uh, what the Messiah would be in, in their terminology. And then, uh, in particular, the fourth beast, uh, which would be the Seleucids, not necessarily the Greeks, um, is, is slain and the kingdom is given to Judah. So God is going to kill all the bad guys and um, set up Judah as, as a mighty kingdom. This was the hope in about 165 BC when the book of Daniel was written. And so here's these are the beasts. Uh, the lion is associated most often with Babylon. Uh, the bear has a bunch of ribs in his teeth. Uh, probably been to Joe's Kansas City rib shop. Or uh, that's Persia. Uh, the multi-headed leopard uh, with the wings is, is Greece. And then the horns, specifically the horns on that ferocious looking dragon are uh, the symbol of the Seleucid Empire and, and uh, of uh, Antiochus, who was persecuting the Hebrews at that time. Uh, this is an apocalyptic strand, uh, typical of apocalyptic literature with elements of predestination, suffering, deliverance, mysterious symbols, ancient heroes, and heavenly messengers. And the story of Antiochus was uh, why... The Hebrews did not like him. Uh, he didn't want them to worship 
their god, their monotheistic god. He wanted them to also include the Greek gods in their worship, and of course they refused to do it, as the Hebrews often did. So Antiochus sent 20,000 troops into Jerusalem on the Sabbath, uh, killed all the males, enslaved the women and children. And this was a story that was written uh, after the fact to give the Hebrew nation some hope that someday Antiochus would be would be destroyed, uh, and then they would be delivered from that oppression. Uh, is it true, uh, the promise that Antiochus would die, was that Antiochus would die in Palestine? He actually died elsewhere, uh, possibly uh, by suicide and, and drowning. He was actually thought somebody was coming for him, and the story is that he drowned himself. Um, the story indicates that the end time had come. This was 165 BCE, so we can say uh, affirmatively that that did not happen. And also the story says that the Jews would have eternal bliss. So I think we can yeah. look at the Jewish history and say that that probably is not true as well. Uh, is it loving and ethical? While the story shows deep concern for Judah, um, it does not have a loving concern for humanity in general, only for the Hebrews. And there was an assumption that ultimately other nations were going to bow down and, and be servants of, of, of Judah, which he Dempsey doesn't feel is, is loving enough. So it was written, though, during a time that they were being oppressed by Antiochus? Yeah, apparently so. So so in that sense, that this truth where somebody is, you know, some Daniel. Yeah, or, there were historical events that precipitated the writing of of this so but they're, they're if, you, if you look at all these empires I, we're going to we're going to be saved kind of yeah part part of what i have, didn't understand is if you look at the empires that the different beasts were supposed to symbolize um they didn't always um chronologically coincide with each other mm -hmm. the greek empire was ancient from 800 bc to 140 bc or something like that the roman empire didn't start until the first Julius Caesar, which is about 44 AD, mm -hmm. 44 BC, and then into into the AD. Mm -hmm. uh, the Babylonian Empire was uh, what six six to the fifth century, followed by the Persian Empire, which was the fifth to the fourth century. So I'm not sure how all of that melds together. I think it's just you know, I, th I think the point is that all of these kingdoms have oppressed us. You know, all through history, we we've been under the boot heel of you know some other country, some other thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now finally with this, this vision of Daniel, uh, it gives some reassurance that God's about to change all of that. He's going to destroy the oppressors and set the Hebrews up, the Israelites up as the rightful owners of, of the land and, and the, the chosen people, so which, was, which has never happened. Sorry, in the way, so. Was Daniel during when they were taken out of Israel and then? Well, the story of Daniel is actually uh, during the Babylonian captivity. Yeah, the writing right. of Daniel, they think, is second century. So there's about a 300. And that's one thing that Dempsey points out is that the, the writer has a lot of the history wrong uh, <laughs> because they're they're writing it 300 years after the fact. And how hard would it be to write something that happened 300 years ago if you don't if you weren't there? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So. No, no, we're That's gonna say not a lot of no good history history books. All right, I hope we're all still friends. <laughs> I've enjoyed this. It was interesting. It was a little stressful at times trying to figure so, out how to cover all this. But.